to our fourth session of uh, uh, Creation versus Evolution. Hope you have outlines and there should be room to take notes. And uh, of course there's blank pages in the back back so you can add notes there if you need to by letter and uh, n number letter indication. But um, today we're going to talk a little bit an about anthropology and move from there. So let's begin with a word of prayer and we'll get into this. Father in Jesus name I pray that you would just uh, touch our hearts and our minds to be able to absorb and understand and to retain so that when we have an opportunity to be able to share with someone uh, that has questions or don't know that they have questions, we would be in a position to share with them in an effective way. And uh, we just uh, pray in Jesus' name for your Holy Spirit to guide our conversation. For it's in his name, Jesus' name, that we ask. Amen. All right. Um, so biological and anthropo anthropolo anthropological. No wonder I always stick when I get to the fifth. What's sounding like me? Am anthropological <laughs> evidence. How old are the oldest living things? Now there are some problems with trying to figure out how old things are. The fossil record, for example. What's the most common way of figuring out how old stuff is? Carbon dating. Carbon dating. And how does that, <coughs> anybody know how that works? Um, okay, so when fossils are formed, there's a certain degree of carbon material that can be detected from the original Big Bang, they say, and it's sort of frozen in time, locked into the fossil, so they can look at the layers and look at that information to help tell how old it is. And it'll help figure out, um, you know, how to compare the age of various layers and animals and things that are found fossilized. Have anybody, what, what, has anybody heard anything about it, whether it's reliable or not? Kind of is it. What they found out is that the date frames can swing wildly one way or the other. Some of it depends on the sensitivity of the equipment they use to identify the carbon traces. And some of it depends on the algorithms they use to manipulate the information, to figure out and whether they should multiply it by years, days, weeks, months, or seconds. Um, you know, so there, there's a, it helps give you a rough chronological order, but it doesn't necessarily give you <coughs> a consistently accurate picture of the exact age of anything in particular. So there, there, there's a problem. There's a wide disparity in the data that uh, is, is difficult to nail it down. So uh, old, oldest living things seem to be around six, seven, eight thousand years. They don't seem to be billions of years and they seem to appear fully formed in the fossil record. And there are some very tiny creatures in the fossil record, by the way. No, we don't see single cell organisms, but we see some things that are pretty close to that. So um, there, there's a lot of information that we can find uh, in the anthropological record. What are the oldest living things? Um, it's kind of hard to put it in the millions of years based on the evidence in the fossil record. Um, all right, so let's take a look at uh, the account for present numbers of human beings. The growth rate of human population is roughly uh, consistent over the years, so a fair amount of accuracy over the last four centuries. Uh, CE is common era, by the way. The uh, scientists got away from AD, year of our Lord, Annum Domini, or BC, before Christ. So now it's uh, BCE, before Common Era, and CE, Common Era. Okay, so that's like an academic thing that you'll find in academic books. Anything past 70s, probably, newer than 70s, they started adopting the BCE, CE standard for time reference. So this equivalent of AD here, okay? So 1 AD, which is generally taken to be uh, the year of the Lord, right? common era began, there were about 200 million people, 1650 there were 500 million people, 1850 there were a billion, twice as many, 
1932 billion, 1975 4 billion, 1994 5.6 billion, and now we're somewhere above 7 billion and counting. So what does that do to the total population? If we go all the way back to the very beginning of creation, when Adam and Eve came on the earth, shouldn't there be a lot more people? That's a problem. So, uh, Henry Morris points out that if one begins with a set of parents who produce 2.6 children, is he the 0.6? I don't know. Yeah? <laughs> He's the last one. Last one, okay. So we'll say 2.6. Look at him, okay. Um, a modern growth rate, slower than past rates, and that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, first of all, people didn't live as long, so they didn't have as long to procreate, make kids. You know, they, they kind of age and die and get beat up or whatever happens. So the uh, lifetime has increased considerably as uh, we've gotten more adept at dealing with medical issues and, and life issues and so on and so forth. Um, so 2.6 is a modern rate. One will have 5.7 billion people in 82 generations or 2,640 years. Old Earth paleontologists tell us human ancestors have been around for over a million years. One wonders why there are not significantly more people than there are, and why are there not significantly more human-like fossils than there are. Now, there are some places, you know, I mentioned the Australopithecus and, and some of the others that uh, coexisted, actually, it turns out, with, with uh, Neanderthal and, and Cro-Magnon and so on and so forth. So there were some, a great deal of overlap between the various kinds of uh, skeleton, skeletal remains that have been identified. Um, and so it's not a clean cut saying these guys died out, then these guys took over, then these guys died out, then these guys took over. And there's not really necessarily any evidence that they were antagonistic to each other in the fossil record. I mean, they're just there. They're, they fall down and go boom. Um, so the age of the Earth, if it's in millions of years, we should have people standing shoulder to shoulder on virtually every habitable part of the planet. Not Maybe not quite that, but quite a few more. We probably, I don't know what the estimate would be, but it would be in the multiple billions of uh, people more than we have now. Any questions on that? Okay, so the question becomes then, did animals evolve? See, when I taught this, that was like the teaser for the next section. But I broke this down into ten sessions, so it's a little bit different. Uh, so the college kids, you know, they'd have to do the research or whatever for the next week and come back. But what do you think? Do, do animals evolve? No. How do you know? Who said that? You did? All right. I heard that voice. Uh, so why not? I believe that God made them only the way they were. Okay. Um, do we see evidence of evolution? Any kind of evolution? Adaptations, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Change only kind of okay. Say that again, a loudly. A change of kind. A change of kind. And that's a key word. In the, in the biblical record, it says, after their own kind, they reproduced, right? So, the issue then, because, so we have two, we have two terms. We talk about microevolution and macroevolution. Microevolution is the adaptation within species to outside influences and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, you, <laughs> bacteria adapts to antibiotics uh, uh, that go in there and try and kill them. So we, that we've developed uh, more, uh, more strenuously strong antibiotics and then they adapt to that. And if you keep using the same, now how many people have ever taken antibiotic? How many people are not raising their hand right now? <laughs> okay, anyway. So, you've heard about the superbugs out there, right? So, some people have a tendency to stop taking the medicine uh, when they feel better, which isn't always a good idea. 
And uh, so what we're going to do is, is kind of talk about some of that. Uh, if you keep taking it long enough through the duration, theoretically, all of the bacteria should be killed. They should be gone. So there won't be any survivors to adapt and then reproduce with a resistance to that antibiotic. See, so that's an example of adaptation that we see all the time at the lowest possible level, at the cellular level. We see that taking place. Uh, we, we see uh, animals developing very thick coats of fur in very cold places, for example. Um, there are uh, snow leopards, which have a very different kind of fur than the leopards that occur down in the forest and the, and the jungles of Africa or the uh, jaguars that occur in South America. Their fur isn't as thick and it's different, it's coarser. So uh, there are adaptations like that. But within a kind, all of the kinds that we see in the fossil record appear abruptly. They don't gradually start changing out and, and shaking hands and say, okay, I'll take it from here and grow an extra leg to do something cool. And then that didn't work, so he grew two legs and crawled out of the water and became a, a lungfish walking around and pretty soon we have monkeys and people. It doesn't work that way. The forms all appear abruptly in the fossil record. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So what do panchronic species say about evolution? Now, the word panchronic, pan means all or across, and chronic is time. So panchronic means at all times, and refers to animals that appear in fossil record hundreds of millions of years ago in essentially the same form as they appear as living creatures today. In other words, panchronic species have appeared in the same form at all times, whether 200 billion years old or whether living one is caught and studied today. Now, I briefly mentioned the, uh, the creature that was pulled up in a fishing trawler in Japan in the northern oceans, and it very much resembled a uh, a sea-bearing dinosaur of days past, a plesiosaur, right? With the paddles and the whole bit, and the long, elongated neck and everything, huge. So uh, there are reports, and, and uh, some attributed to myth, but there are actual pictures in various tribal areas in the inner uh, jungles of Africa, the, the tribal areas, uh, that uh, they have found pictures of what looks like a brontosaurus. A very large creature with a long tail and a very tall neck and that arches. So, you know, we have seen those in the fossil record and there are pictures. Well, where do they get the pictures? They must have seen them. Um, so it, it creates a, a sort of a, an interesting conundrum for evolutionists trying to figure out, well, okay, everything died off and laid, laid, laid the way for the next. Uh, maybe not. Maybe there's still some running around, or at least there were recently enough, where tribal uh, groups in Africa, for example, still have pictures of them. Okay, so the reason panchronic species are important is because they illustrate what creationists have been saying all along. Animal species appear abruptly in the fossil record, then remain in exactly that same form to the present day, unless they become extinct. If natural selection, in quotes here, is the mechanism which enables organisms to evolve, why did it fail to function with panchronic species? What makes these species so perfect that they could not be improved upon for hundreds of millions of years? Okay, now you understand what this uh, so-called uh, natural selection means. Everybody understand that term? Have you heard it before? Anybody not understand that term? So natural selection then is the um, postulated process by evolutionists where uh, this animal gets better at stuff, he eats all the food and the other one dies, or he attacks the other one and kills him, or whatever. They overcome, overpower, and they survive for the next level of the so-called evolutionary process. Survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. Now, we have sort of a survival of the fittest mentality among humankind, that just means we're not evolving, we're just becoming more politically or militarily or whatever adept. And so, you know, I mean, 
Uh, the acquisition of power is a very intoxicating thing, but people are still people. Human beings are still human beings. They appear abruptly, and they haven't changed much. There have been some minor variations. Um, Microevolution refers to the adaptation process. Macro is referring to the so-called um, one species gives way to the next in the survival of the fittest mode, natural selection. So a good resource is uh, listed there. Here are some following examples from this resource. You flip over the second page there. A 50 million year old bat fossil was discovered in Wyoming in the Eocene rock, appearing precisely as bats appear today. It was dated at 50 million years. The tuatara is a large lizard-like reptile found in New Zealand, and uh, it is identical to fossils which go back 135 million years. It's a giant, giant lizard, basically. Um, the Neopilina is a uh, bivalve mollusk, as well as horseshoe crabs, look the same today as their fossils that are aged at 500 million years. Cockroaches, our favorite, 250 million years old, and dragonflies, 170 million years old, appear exactly the same today. Now, in the fossil record, there are some larger dragonflies. How'd you like one about, I don't know, six inches to a foot wingspan flying in your face? That'd be cool, huh? Yeah, strap a load to it, and we don't even need uh, drones anymore. All right, uh, starfishes appear today exactly as they did 500 million years ago. Bacteria, 500, 600 million years old, looks just like its present day living ancestor. Now, in Mesopotamia, there's a tree living today that looks like its fossil counterparts 600 million years old. Uh, fossil ginkgo trees, 200 million years old, and sisad trees, I don't know if that's sisad or sisad, uh, 225 million years old are indistinguishable from their present day counterparts. So you get the idea. There's a whole bunch of these as we go down, one after the other, after the other, after. There's a lot, and this is just a sampling of the list, which in the book is not entirely exhaustive, but much more so than we have room for here. So any questions about this piece, about the part with the uh, animals that appear the same as they do in supposedly millions of years ago in the fossil record? So how do they then even get that idea that, I mean, because that's all those gaps basically, I mm -hmm. guess. That's all the, when they're saying that supposedly this was this, so how do they get, do, how do they have a fossil that says, okay, this is a starfish, and then they see this other one, and they say, oh, this is different now. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't get that. How well, that's the this. problem. They can't identify a modified starfish that has more legs, or whatever it would be that it would modify to. Uh, there is no um, gap, um, you know, the, the so-called missing link for any species that we are aware of. Nobody has ever found. There have been a few that have been fabricated to try and prove the point, which were shown to be false and deliberately set up, but there, uh, there is no record of anyone identifying clearly a, uh, a transitional form from one to the next. They just the new ones start, period. The old ones may or may not go away. Maybe they're still there. So I don't know how they say that. They suppose it. They pose it as part of the uh, evolutionary theory. The problem is, though, that they tend to treat theory as fact, even though they don't have empirical evidence to prove otherwise. And they teach it to kids. And they teach it to kids, and they get very upset if anybody mentions anything about a, a intelligent design or creationist perspective or any of those things. So it's kind of a problem, and it's a one-sided uh, approach to something. Um, but it's, it's, I guess, part of the, um, shall I say, human condition. We have a tendency to rush to judgment about all kinds of things. We saw that recently 
in the last uh, few weeks, months actually, with the Kavanaugh hearings and everything that led up to it, and is likely to follow on from it. Uh, but you know, the same applies. Scientists are human too, so they want they want to prove what they believe almost religiously to be true, uh, so that they can say this is it. And we don't quite agree with that because the evidence is not sufficient to support evolution. There's a great deal of evidence, and it is mounting with some of the objections I've already mentioned, for the idea of intelligent design and a creator creating all of existence. Because yeah, if we did that, how would we be able to fly or go to space or cure can help try to cure cancer? I mean, it's like you're always there's always an idea at first. Yeah. And then you build upon it and try to do better and better. I mean, it, we wouldn't have done anything if we just stuck and to see, one idea. That, that, you know, that, that's a good point. Um, that goes to uh, saying in the Bible that uh, we are created in God's image. Part of his image is being creative. We're very creative. Uh, part of his image has to do with how we treat others. And so social norms and morality and those things are part of who God is, and we are created in his image. So all those things flow directly from our being created in his image. In the animal world, where they are not created in his image, it is a very savage environment. The assumption, therefore, by the uh, evolutionists was because it's so violent and so, you know, uh, eat each other. You've seen the picture of the little fish and the great big fish flying it when you catch the big one, right? So they're all going to bump, 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 chomp down and get the one in front of them. That's how nature is. Recently there was a pair of, did you see these? I think they were white albino tigers, was it? Cubs? And they were starved to death. And this is in a zoo, I think, because the mother ignored them. They were odd. They were different. So the mom thought they were defective. So they began feeding these cubs and taking care of them and raising them that way on the bottle and so on and so forth. But that's how nature is. When mama sees something's weird, she's going to leave it alone and let it die. Black widows are a little bit more vicious. <laughs> As are praying mantis. Mm -hmm. Praying mantis right. the same way. And they don't, they're, they look, they're called that because they look like they're praying. But it's P R E Y, and they pray. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So I have a question back to human human skeletons. When so the Tower of Babel was post flood. Yeah. And that was naughty. Yep. And and. Um, what was naughty about it? Well, it was pride, and they thought that they were going to be higher than God again. Okay. All right, so and attaining to yes. the height of God. All right. Yes. So. Um, so the assumption of a God was there. Absolutely, um, and it was it was for the reason that they not be scattered over all the world. Um, yeah. And that's what happened. What happened? That they were scattered. Is that what, what else happened? happened? I don't know the answers to the questions you asked, so it's easier if you just The answer. language <laughs> was also confused. Right. They couldn't understand each other all of a sudden. Which they is why we have computer them. programs now called Babel. Yeah, Babel. <laughs> and the, the, babble irony, the, the Babel fish. The irony, Anybody know where the Babel fish comes from? Mm -mm. What? Really? Uh, I'm learning. That's what we're the here. Babel fish is a little fish that goes in your ear and suddenly you can understand every language you ever hear anywhere in the universe. It was a construct in uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> anyway, that's a cute series of books, but um, the last one, or the, you know, so long and thanks for all the fish, I think. And uh, the, the ultimate number of the universe is 42. I'm kind of disappointed in that. I thought it'd be 37. That's a prime number. It's a much better number. But, uh, but isn't, I mean, even with language, like you're saying, confused, you could learn a language but most of the time, people, when they speak a language, it's something that's in them. It's their they culture. It's everything. It. Right. And right. so it's not just the words spoken. 
it's an attitude, it's everything else. And yep. so you, you learn it, but someone could be speaking to you and they could have a totally different meaning to the same word you're speaking back to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what was the question about Babel? They were confused because of their attempt to ascend to the height of God, right? Right. So skeletons yeah. of these people were scattered all over the earth. Yeah. We're assuming um, in a supernatural way. Why do we assume that? I assume that. Okay, so my assumption is in some kind of supernatural way because pridefully they wanted to stay and so my mind would say that unless it was supernatural they would have stayed. Well, what what is a natural reaction? Maybe it's not natural. Oh, well, okay. Well, their language was confused, thus they formed groups and went their own way. Right, and what yeah. happens when somebody starts talking to you like you ought to understand you don't? You slap their face. You're, you're going to get, yeah. Sorry. It's going to create an emotional <laughs> response at least, and maybe sometimes a more lethal response. So when groups don't understand each other, their language is confused and so on and so forth, understanding is, is confused, it creates natural turmoil. So they hit Splitsville, they get out of Dodge, they just scatter, go find their own stuff, and they just gradually kept migrating and roaming around the earth as they could. Um, you know, we see, well, that, no, okay, that's, I don't want to get too far afield here. So the above abbreviated uh, Q, looking at Q now, uh, abbreviated survey is barely representative of what occurs in the fossil record. If natural selection really does function always and everywhere through time, why are there, there are so many living creatures, aquatic as well as terrestrial, plants, animals, and insects, and bacteria, that have not changed since they first appear in the fossil record? So, here are three <coughs> thoughts about that. Organisms living in virtually every ecosystem, eating a wide variety of foods, have remained unchanged for hundreds of millions of years, assuming the millions of years hypothesis. Animals using a variety of forms of locomotion, flying, crawling, swimming, jet propulsion, walking, and stationary, with a variety of predators, have successfully survived without adapting to any new changes in environment for hundreds of millions of years. Note that a line 100 million inches long will be over 1,500 miles long. 100 million years is a very long time for an organism to survive unchanged. Now, some of the more exotic kinds of life, there are um, thermal vents at very deep places in the ocean that are very hot, that are superheated, and there are animals and, and plants and microorganisms that live and thrive in that extremely hot environment. And we, you know, have figured out, at least we, there's a surmise that uh, they, they are able to ingest the stuff coming out of these vents somehow, and that becomes part of their food. I mean, that's what they're bathed in all day and all night, except they don't have day and night, it's so dark. So, you know, there are all kinds of interesting and exotic adaptations all over planet Earth. But bacteria is bacteria, you know, birds is birds. Um, do we, okay, what's the difference between a poodle and a chihuahua? One's ugly. <laughs> Before or after trimming, you're talking about the chihuahua or the poodle? Okay. Uh, if you put a bunch of highly bred dogs that are specific, quote, unquote, kinds of dogs, right? Mm -hmm. You have a Chihuahua, you've got a, a, a Rottweiler, you know, and so on and so forth, and you put them on an island, after two or three generations, they're all going to be a bunch of butts that look pretty much the same. All that specialized breeding disappears. So in the natural order of things, the tendency that is postulated by evolutionary theory toward 
specialization does not hold up. It takes someone who really knows what they do to very carefully breed plants and or animals to get the result that they want. But left to their own, they will interbreed, and eventually you have a bunch of mongrel mutts that look the same running around on this remote island. I mean, you know, that's, that's the problem. Another hole in the evolutionary theory is they don't, they don't evolve to a more specialized form. They devolve. Just the opposite. Okay, any questions? Is this all making sense? Okay. All right, so are there limitations to variations? Genes that control variations in organisms demonstrate a limit to how far those organisms can change. So we're going to examine some of those limits and conclude that these limits preclude the possibility of evolution. So the, the, the amount of change that can take place uh, based on the genetic level is limited and you can't get past it once you reach that limit, whatever that limit is. Okay, so genetic hybrids tend to return to a more generic basic form. Some genetic hybrids that are bred are sterile. Who can think of an example? Liger. The Liger? Somebody else said something? What? Donkey. Donkey, yes. Horses and mules. And the result is a donkey. Zebra. <laughs> I'm sorry, that just, you know, I, I meant, I meant donkey. Um, anyway, okay, so that should probably be edited out. Yes, sir. What the, you the liger? Yeah, I've never heard of that. They, yeah, they have it on Google. It's, a, it's like a 13 foot a tiger slash lion. It's ridiculous. It's super cool. Interbreed them, but they can't do anything. Can't yeah, they can reproduce, but it's like a monster. Really? Like, yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's really cool looking. What? It's, it's yeah. like huge. It's got so well, nice um, stripes. Oh, cool. Yeah, because a tiger would be really powerful. I mean, they're. They're more muscular than a lion would be, but the lion's large, and I can see it both of that together. Would right. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But they can't reproduce once they do that. Right. Because they are different breeds. They are of their own kind. Now, dogs and dogs, you can breed. And you breed. Um, I, had a, I knew a guy once that had a dog that was a cross between a St. Bernard and a German Shepherd. And this thing was enormous like a St. Bernard, but very light in form and, and action, uh, like a German Shepherd. He was taking his dog for a walk, and there was this neighbor that had a particularly obnoxious German Shepherd that occasionally would jump the fence and go after people he was after in the neighborhood. Well, he was walking his dog, and this, this other dog jumped the fence, and his dog just shook him out like a rag doll. And didn't kill him, but took care of business. I mean, it's it's a powerful animal. So, but because they're both of the canine species kind, they can interbreed and still reproduce. Horses are not mules. Lions are not tigers or leopards. See, so when you interbreed kinds, you may get an offspring, but the offspring offspring will be sterile. There will be, uh, it, if, it's, if it's a male, it would not have uh, capable little guys. And if it's a female, it wouldn't have capable little receptors. Yes, sir. So like with humans, will change like people that live in a more sunnier climate, their pigmentation gets darker so that they can protect themselves yeah. from the sun. But because they have to hunt, they don't grow a third leg or a fourth leg and be able to run faster. Yeah, that's kind of hard. Yeah. Anybody ever run in a three-legged race? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just saying. Not then, more efficient. Yeah, and then people that lived in colder climates, a lot of times they had more hair on their body and stuff like that. Maybe they were a little bit bigger yeah. and stuff like that to be able to take care of the cold that they were. Well, even the kind of hair. I mean, if you think about it, the same things that govern pigmentation, um, you know, if, if, if you look at uh, tribes in Africa, 
the, the tightly curled hair kind of stands up away and allows aeration. And it allows, you know, evaporation of perspiration. Oh. I mean, there, there are some very specific adaptations to climate that are out there. Now they tend to stick. I'm sorry? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there are some very cool adaptations among humans. They're all over the place. Um, so th that's another, that's a good point. I mean, that's, that's what we need to understand. There are changes that are possible and that will happen and adaptation does occur. Um, so could it be possible then, like people that have darker skin pigmentation, that they mm -hmm. gradually over generations would then lose it as vice versa as someone who's maybe has hardly any, but then went to an environment that had they could actually gain and become darker. Yeah, if you like to like a colder climate or something like that, wouldn't that change? It might. It might well. And I don't know how many generations it would take. Uh, then you've got the factors of intermarriage and so on as well. So, you know, I mean, that's, there are a lot of vari variables in that equation. So it's possible. Uh, I don't know that it's something we can observe happening, but it is certainly something that we can see these kinds of uh, pigmentation and, and other qualities versus these kinds of pigmentation and other qualities. I mean, long straight hair uh, sticks and, and keeps you warmer. It, it creates a barrier. Animals really have it because fur. They don't have hair, they have fur. And so they, they're very thick undercoating and then a longer outer coating and so on and so forth in, in cold environments. If you look at huskies, for example. So they have, they have several kinds down to the nap of the fur all the way up to the outer fur that, that is longer and extends beyond. And that's an adaptation to the cold. It keeps it cold close to the body, but it keeps the snow away from getting in on the outer fibers of, of hair, of the, of the fur. So um, when we have these kinds of changes taking place, uh, I would say they're expected and normal. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Last night, I just happened to catch the last hour, hour and a half of Castaway. Anybody ever seen that? Oh, yes. yes. Tom, Hanks. Tom Hanks? Yeah. I mean, very, very I, overall, I thought it was an interesting movie. It takes a long time to watch it. <laughs> it's three hours and 15 minutes long. Had you never seen it? You've never seen it? Had you never seen it? Oh, I've seen it before, oh, several okay. times, yeah. Okay. But we were watching something else, and I was surfing the channels and decided, well, we're early enough in this, let's watch this. <laughs> so um, we dropped into that, and we're watching it, and at the beginning, you know, he had the white skin. Toward the end, he had very bronzed skin. And if everybody gets that and they're raised that way, eventually, um, what we happen, what we appear to see, is there is a, a change that takes place in that climate uh, situation. So, you know, there, there's still a lot of uh, for sure stuff out there that we can't pin down. But we do see the evidence that changes do occur in, as adaptation. It just does. Okay? But we don't grow gills. Um, <laughs> of course we do. Of course you do. <laughs> I actually had an argument with a guy. He was pretty bright, too. He was, um, um, he was a cryptanalyst. Anybody know what a cryptanalyst is? He sat in a safe, literally. His office door was this thick. And he was locked in there with air conditioning, and it, nobody could get in there. I mean, with the whole the big things that go in, and you turn it, and they go into the, the jam, so you can't get in there. That's where he worked. And he spent all day long listening to Russian language transmissions. This was in Belgium, sorry, Netherlands, actually in, in um, Maastricht, Maastricht, in Holland. And um, that's all he did is listen for key words and codes and then analyze and decide if they were things that are being sent messages that we needed to be aware of. Uh, he was a cryptanalyst, a very bright young man. Um, so he would listen not just for the Russian transmissions, but listen for code words and code language. I mean, yeah, I'll be at the store at 7. And the store between us is a code for 
I'll be at the whatever, the library or, you know, whatever. Um, so you say things that are sound normal, but if it's agreed upon language, then it can become something else. So uh, he and I were talking, I, everybody else, the band had gone up there to do this thing and we were staying in the barracks there. Uh, I was, uh, this guy um, somehow introduced me to him. I walked in and, and looked at his stuff and what he was doing. He was about to take a break. He came out of his safe and he introduced me to a guy in the guard shack and he played chess with and he was a chess player. I'm some, something of a chess player. And we were talking about creation versus evolution too, just he and I for a while. And he said, well, of course we evolved from, from aquatic creatures because early in the development of the human uh, fetus, uh, there are gill structures where the lungs belong. And then eventually lungs form because they need the gills to be able to breathe underwater. Uh, I said, okay, so uh, if you also said your, one of your hobbies is astronomy. There is a horsehead nebula out there, right? He says, yeah. Have you ever seen it? Well, uh, yeah, I have actually. It's pretty cool. So it looks like there's a giant horsehead out there. Does that mean there's a race of giant horses running around the uh, universe? Well, no, of course not. That's silly. So the appearance of something doesn't make it what you assume it might be. And he didn't have a good answer for that one. Um, so anyway, it was an interesting conversation. He had had a friend, he'd been stationed in Saudi Arabia, listening, he was doing the same thing down there for a while. And he had a friend who was part of that same group, and he said he was always trying to get me to go to church and become a Christian and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, that was an interesting conversation. He allowed for the fact that there are people who are Christians, but he, he wasn't prepared at that point to uh, commit his life to Christ. But he knew most of the, the considerations and arguments one would give. So, uh, and it wasn't an antagonistic conversation by any means. So the, there, the, we must have come from fish because there are things that look like gills during the development of the uh, fetus. Or monkeys because the tail <laughs> I've heard that one. Yeah, yeah. Too, yeah. It just kind of, we didn't need it anymore for balance, so it just stopped growing as long. Yeah. Yeah, you should. Thanks. I, I kind of fear for what you might teach. <laughs> All right. Already worse than it already is. It, what? Can't be any worse than it already is in school. No, Sunday school. Oh, He's talking about Sunday school. school. No, regular school. It's your tail yeah. bone. You know, like oh. evolution. We came from monkeys to got a tail bone. Yeah, that's, that's why we have a tail bone. Yeah. All right. Now, some examples. Cattle, dogs, horses have been carefully selected through restricted breeding. There is a biblical example of that as well. Anybody remember it? A breeding for the benefit of somebody? No, we're not. Anybody ever read the Old Testament? I've, I've read <laughs> Okay. Well, there was this guy who went to find a wife. Remember that? John? John? <laughs> no, he's pretty old, but that's the New Testament. <laughs> now I saw a couple of... Anybody know what I'm talking about now? He had to win? Yeah. Uh, no. No. Um, yes, Jacob. So he went to his, his father's cousin or something. Uncle, uncle, that's what it was. And he saw this beautiful woman by the well. And he thought, if she offers me water, she's the one. And she did, and she was. And he went all goo goo eyes over it. And uh, so uh, they tricked him, and he ended up marrying Leah. Yes. Wasn't it? Oh, he sent a servant out first to, to find him a wife. Yeah, right. So this is where he made a father or whatever. He what? The cattle. Yes, it was sheep, lambs, goats. Bred them. So he what? had all the ones that weren't, and then yeah. so he tricked. 
Yeah. yeah. So he left with a huge number, and that was all his. I'll take the ones that are spotted. Yeah, they're spotted. They're defective. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so selective breeding is not new, and it's in the Bible, and the results are documented. That's the point. The point wasn't the marriage and the characters. So, you know, we haven't just stumbled upon this in the last couple of decades. This is something that's been going on a long time throughout human history. They have interbred racing horses and in the Roman Colosseums with the chariot races and et cetera, et cetera. Not so trying to get the fastest one, like so right. like, like the ones now when they win all the big races. They'll want to breed that one with other ones who will buy right. so that they can hopefully get so the same thing. So they want some of that, right. Yeah. But, right. They're not, but they're not getting faster. They're not getting notably faster. If you look at, look, if you look at, the, yeah, I, if you look at the records over the last 200 years of thoroughbreds, they're not getting particularly faster. I was faster. about to say track record, but that's yeah. Well, yeah, I would think horses, you can only go so fast, I mean, unless you got more muscles or longer legs or something like that, you couldn't ever get any faster. But so, 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 how so, long can a horse run at the top of his game? Well, maybe, what, an hour, maybe? Well, no, oh, wow, no. no? Most horse races are a lot shorter than that. No, I'm just saying, like, if they yeah. had to run out, I mean, like, back in the day when they used to... I'm just saying, express. years, how, how long, how many years can oh. a horse run at its prime and keep winning races, even the most thoroughly bred horse? They may get, what, two or three seasons? Two or three years. They'll yeah, kind of come it. up to it, and then, then they'll peak. Then that's it. Yeah. Then their job becomes what you said, breeding. That's all they do. They're sort of put out to pasture, as it were. But they want to pass along that genetic makeup because they see it as something that's important. Okay. But, yeah. but like I was, um, like I seen like with people with dogs, I guess like they've tried to, like I guess a Dalmatian, they've tried to, interbreed them so much that there's now defects like some of them were born blind some of them you know they have all, all these problems I mean like bulldogs I've heard that about their legs their hind legs that they get problems because they've tried to interbreed them so much to make them like a perfect are, right. bulldog that they've caused defects my son and his wife have three miniature long-haired dachshunds cute as buttons but dachshunds are long and short-legged, they're bred to go into burrows and they will outfight a badger. I mean, that's part of what they were bred for, is to go in and get after them and bring them out. Long snouts, so they can grab enough to haul them out and do some damage, um, and short legs. But one problem they've had, and two out of his three doc, do, or dachshunds have had this, the lower back begins to uh, have problems. And it sags, and they have vertebral incon inconstancy, or whatever they call it. Um, and it, so the back near the, uh, the the rear legs becomes a real problem. And some sometimes requires surgery. They've had surgery for one. The other one, they're able to do some uh, therapy for it. But for a while, the one could just drag his back legs around until they had the surgery. And he was in a great deal of pain. So anyway, so that was a, that's what. Those were bred for. They were long and narrow and powerful snout that was long, and they could grab the thing and drag it out. Right? So, yeah, there's a lot of that, and they are purpose built. Uh, everybody thinks little pug dogs are so cute. Personally, I think they're kind of ugly. Oh, I agree with you. <laughs> but they have serious, serious problems breathing, and uh, they, I mean, they have. Uh, a lot of incidences of having infections and things that are literally like pneumonia and so on and so forth because of the, the smashed in features there's no room for the normal sinus um, activity to take place within the skull there's just no room for it so we do we we like them because we think it's cute, but we do, do do we do the dogs any favors when they do that, or the cats or whatever? Same thing with pug dogs, cats. They have no sinus space up here, so they snot and drool all the time. <laughs> okay, <It is. laughs> how's that for a picture? Yeah. <laughs> right. So if hybrid animals were ever turned loose on an island, they would interbreed and return to an original mongrel form. That's what we mentioned earlier. 
Farmers often purchase hybrid seeds for spring planting. These hybrid seeds promise higher yields at harvest, yet the farmer cannot simply keep some of the seeds produced and plant them next year. In other words, if you plant hybrid corn in the ground, the seeds from the corns, uh, cor uh, cobs, will not do anything. They will not germinate in the ground. So they make lots of corn and it's good and sweet and this, that, and the other. The farmer simply uh, cannot keep some of the seeds produced and plant them. The hybrid forms tend to return to their original, more generic form. So this principle of genes tending to return to the most generic norm argues against the very concept of evolution, which requires that genes, one, have no ultimate variation limit, and two, retain rare, that is, uniquely advantageous features over the next generations. And it doesn't happen. Left to themselves, without breeding interference, they will return to a common denominator form. So highly bred animals are weaker, generally, more prone to disease, less fertile. We've already mentioned donkeys. Um, in fact, if bred too far, the animal becomes infertile. When, um, when we got our German short hair, we learned a lot about um, animals being bred, and we learned the difference between German short hairs and, and drops and the different lines, and how, how specialized some of these breeds are, and how far back lines go, and how crazy people get. Mm -hmm. over these things and it can be it can be maddening to want to go back 10 generations for your dog mm -hmm. I can't go back one generation on my paternal side but I know five generations on my dog on both <laughs> sides it's ridiculous it is I agree. Crazy. I've, now, I, it's I accidentally oh, watched part of it. But still, it's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Well, I, I accidentally watched yeah, some of the so Kennel Club dog show, and they have these dogs prancing around. And this one won, and oh, accolades, he's wonderful, he's marvelous. What? He's just a dog walking around. So, you know, uh, who decides what the ideal form is, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So we decide, but genetic material does not, and that's the point. Yeah, he, he, I would guess that, that we had friends that, 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 bred this, that bred this dog, that's why we ended up with him. But, and he's just a, an incredibly beautiful animal that grabs his teddy bear when he sees the mailman. Um, okay. But he's ridiculous. It's just, they had, to, they had to be so careful with these lines for all of these years, yeah. hundreds of years. Of, of man's interference, making sure that all of this was held in check mm -hmm. to produce exactly what exactly they wanted right to combination. produce. Right. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. Okay, so, and that is sometimes referred to as microevolution. But we still have no transitional forms. No. We have no record in the fossil record of any transitional form whatsoever for any kind of animal or plant, any kind of living organism, period. No X-Men. No what? X-Men? Oh, no, yeah. No X-Men. Really? Yeah. It's that would be cool. I actually no, they live on flat earth. That's not really cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, any final questions or comments? Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we just ask that you would go with us this morning. We thank you for the time we've been able to spend together and talk about these subjects. And uh, I pray that you would uh, help us to absorb this, help these outlines to be useful references. Uh, and I pray that uh, the service this morning, your Holy Spirit, would work all over this campus, that you would touch every car as they enter and find their place and help build a sense of expectation of what you're going to do in their hearts and minds. I pray that you would be with our pastor and the worship team and all those involved with putting the service together and making things happen behind the scenes and that you would anoint each one in his or her role. 
I pray, Father, that you would just transform hearts and minds, that you would change lives this morning in this service. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.